me avisa. We're ready. All right. So, greetings and good afternoon to all. Thank you for accepting uh, our invitation to this uh, webinar titled Live and Online Finding What's Worse for Synchronous, uh, at Synchronous Class Meetings with today presenters, Dr. Stella Porto. And we also have our moderator, Dr. Carlos Morales, head chair and president of TTC Connect Campus of Tarrant County College in Texas. Thank you both for your valuable collaboration with this initiative that aims to provide special support to uh, member institutions as part of HEADS missions to promote the integration of technology into education. Today, we have more than 180 participants registered from 18 higher ed institutions in Puerto Rico, including the Department of Education as well. Welcome all. We also have 16 higher education uh, participants from 16 higher educations in the U.S. Welcome as well. And we have also participants from three different organizations and also three international institutions, one from Mexico, Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, also from Barbados, Barbados Community College, and from Portugal, Escola Profesional Agostino Rosetta Castelo Branco. Welcome all. Thank you so much for your time and for being here. We hope that this webinar will be of great benefit to everyone. Before we begin, for this semester, we, were, we made the welcome presentation that you saw already with the announcements and promotions of the upcoming webinars to dedicate the most time to our special guests, like today, Dr. A. Uh, Porto, and we, but we just want to highlight that the next webinar will be in, for faculty will be in April 23 at 3 p.m. Eastern time and will be in Spanish titled Gamificando Entornos Virtuales de Aprendizaje, Herramientas y Estrategias Activas. And remember that this semester we are inviting international speakers and, and that, for that webinar uh, we will have Dr. Karina González from Universidad de la Laguna in Spain and will be moderated as well by Dr. Carlos Morales, his chair. Please share with others, help us promote the invitations to our webinar so they can register to participate and benefit from this webinar as well. Finally, I just want to emphasize that at the end of this webinar, you will receive an email with the link to complete a short electronic survey to help us evaluate this webinar and help us also identify which head services and initiative can support faculty, administrators, and your students, and also your feedback to how, how to promote these services more efficiently. The survey is anonymous, and the estimated time to complete it is around five minutes. So we will appreciate your time to complete this survey because your feedback is very important to us. Now we are ready to start our webinar. Um, I am pleased to present Dr. Carlos Morales, his chair, who will moderate the webinar and present our guest speaker today. Go ahead, Carlos. Thank you, Belkis. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your attendance this afternoon to our uh, webinar. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stella Porto, and she's currently a learning specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, D.C. She has been with the IDB since September of 2014, and the IDB, through its knowledge and learning division, offers a variety of e-learning products uh, to the Latin American um, and Caribbean regions. Stella manages the design, development, and delivery of several of these activities. Prior to the IDB, Stella was the director of the Masters of Distance Education and E-Learning, MDE, at the University of Maryland Global Campus, where she also held other positions since 2001. Prior to that role, she was a professor of computer science for about around nine years in her native country of Brazil. Outside of her full-time job duties, Stella is part of the QM Research college, college team and a facilitator for Quality Matters. Stella also works on various consulting projects related to online learning through her own business, Stellar J Consulting. 
Stella holds a bachelor's in science in electrical engineering and a master's and doctoral degrees in computer science. And much later, she added a master's in distance education. Again, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stella Porto and, and just say a, a moment of privilege. Uh, it's funny because earlier today she was holding a session and I was an attendee uh, to that <laughs> session she was holding as part of uh, her duties with the IDB and now and now we are on the opposite side of the of the screen. But again, uh, it is my pleasure to uh, leave the stage to Stella. Stella, you can take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you for the invite. I suppose someone will be sharing my my slides. Yes. They should be up. Yes, soon. I will. Hold on there. I, I just yes. confused of the other <laughs> one. Okay, this is presentation. Uh -huh. sure enough. There you go. Thank go you. So thank you so much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, and uh, when Carlos was introducing me, he mentioned my, my work with Quality Matters. And actually, this presentation was produced together with a colleague, uh, Barbara Birch, in Quality Matters. Um, and and I think it's it's a very interesting topic given the 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 last year that we had with uh, such a um, influx of new people in the in the online arena. So um, the the goals the the objectives that I would like for you to have in mind for this uh, presentation is that I want to discuss the role of synchronous classes in interactions in online learning. I want you to be able to identify when and how to plan synchronous interactions as part of a course design. And I also want to um, discuss uh, strategies that will help balance engagement in synchronous and asynchronous interaction. So what I, ha what I have planned for today uh, is first, I really wanted to spend some time talking about this change in context. I don't know about you all. I don't know if you are new to online learning or if you've been more recently connected to online learning. But for those who have been in this field for, for some time, this last year has been really something to observe. And I think probably down the road, we're going to be able to sort of Look at this. Look at this. You know, with hindsight, and have a better understanding of the impact of this. Uh, but I think it's very interesting what has happened, and I've done a lot of thinking. So I want to start with with that context. Then I want to really frame what I consider to be online synchronous class meetings. So we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and then I'm going to start with, and this is where uh, my work with Quality Matters really comes into play, is that Quality Matters, the research colleague group, does a lot of the collecting and the curation of the literature. And Barbara did a great job of uh, putting together what the literature had about uh, synchronous meetings uh, in online learning. And then uh, uh, after we look at what the literature says, I want to, you know, pick up on the context, see how what what changes in those findings. And this is not yet. Uh, some of these things are not yet published because we don't have the time yet to have uh, to have research on it. But it's going to be interesting when research starts being published about that. And then um, I'll end with talking about some recommendations in terms of design considering this new environment where synchronous has taken a much uh, a, a place of much more prominence and how to better plan for synchronous meetings. So let's start with uh, this, this contextualizing. And the first uh, sentence here is really uh, uh, really touches me and I, I saw that black uh, the that Paul Blackman is in the audience and he will totally understand why I'm saying this because for those who studied distance education and then online education as something you know as a as a evolution of distance education the history of online education is really asynchronous Everything, if you look at the literature in terms of 
methodologies and uh, theoretical pillars, all of it kind of speaks to asynchronous interaction. And sometimes if you go back to that literature and you read it again and you now consider that so much is being done through Zoom, it's almost like it's a little bit awkward. Things don't fit very well. But I think it's important to go to look at that, um, to look at this fact that the, the history of online education is asynchronous and look at why is it that, that it's, it is that way. And I think there are several reasons. One of the reasons I, I totally agree when people argue about that with me, it is a technological reason, right? I mean, we didn't have a technology that allowed for us to interact synchronously. And, you know, when I say synchronously, mostly I'm talking about what we're doing now with video conferencing. Um, and so the history is certainly related to advancements in technology. But there are also other reasons uh, for that. Uh, some of those reasons are related to understanding an audience and understanding an audience that looked, looked to distance education and online education uh, for access. And access related to independence from time and independence uh, um, from space. So I think it's important to not forget about those things. Uh, I think we're now living in this moment where we have all of this, all of these pillars built on top of these beliefs and suddenly they might be forgotten and we start questioning some of these models because, you know, everything is done now through video conference. There are reasons, and some of these reasons are even related to making education more democratic and more accessible to people. So I want to really uh, keep that in mind. However, um, let, however, I think we can't forget, right, what happened in 2020. So in 2020, if you remember just a year, a little bit over a year ago, you know, suddenly we were talking about remote learning. Suddenly this, this word, we, I, I, I didn't hear it as a common word. And then suddenly it was all this remote learning. And I even remember uh, having some webinars where people would say, no, 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 no. This is not online learning. This is remote learning. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, yes, maybe there is this, this new thing that is remote learning, that is just simply everything, you just take everything you do, you do face to face and now, okay, we do remotely. Uh, and we can go on and on and on to discuss uh, uh, how valid that is, how, how sustainable that is. But the fact is that that wasn't that, that concept was introduced. And I think uh, what happened throughout the, the 2020 is that we had an influx of an audience and when I say and maybe the word shouldn't be audience it's, it's an audience but it's also a whole group of stakeholders uh, uh, that were very different from the people that were living in the online learning environment you had now students and teachers and administrators who are thrown into the situation of having to do things virtually when in fact none of these people actually had made the option for something that was independent of time and space so they didn't have those needs all those needs that were sort of the base for everything that was done for online learning now you have actually people that if they had the choice they wanted to be in class with everybody else and having a lot of contact with these people they did not want to be separated by technology and i think it is really important to recognize that now and we'll have to see how this develops into the future that now we have this very diverse diverse groups both of, of students as well as faculty. And let's not forget, I can never forget that because I, I was and am still in a, a manager of online learning. And there are all, all the needs of, of management and administration that we have to, to consider. So there's an impact. 
Um, so what does this mean? Uh, it means then that we have a whole new set of needs. We have a whole new set of requirements. And we have many institutions with very limited experience in online learning. And so for these institutions uh, that have little experience and, and less history of distance education, the, the intuition of moving online is obviously, you know, I want to just transfer everything. I want to transfer what I was able to live uh, in the classroom to now something that is mediated through technology. The problem is that you cannot bring the physicality, uh, the sense of presence that we have in a, in a space, in, a, in the same space to the virtual environment. For example, I'll give you an example right now. I am here in, in front of the camera. I can't see you all. Even if you all had video, I could not see you. And that already gives me a completely different sense of not, you know, I can't move. I have to be sitting here. All of this uh, has a, a huge impact on not being able to simply transfer everything that we did uh, in the face-to-face -face environment to the online. So even if we consider that our methodology will be, let's say, mainly using video conferencing, it is not a one-to-one -one transfer. And we have to rethink a lot of the assumptions and reconsider best practices. So, so there are two things. One, you have the people that came with the belief that asynchronous was the main uh, sort of leading track for online learning and maybe considered synchronous as something that was like a small add-on. Uh, they have to be rethinking this because now they have the different needs. And at the same time, you have all these new people that are considering video conferencing as the answer, but they too have to rethink because it's not possible to transfer everything that you were doing face-to-face -to, -face to a video conferencing situation. So there's these sort of two groups coming together and we need to find, you know, this, this balance of how to do this well. So I want to step back a little bit. I had mentioned that I was going to talk about what the literature says. Um, and before I do that, I want to first, so we're all on the same page, I want to characterize uh, what I'm calling a synchronous class meeting right because we today have so many technologies and the models that we use for delivering online learning are so diverse that we probably need to sort of wrap our hands around this and, and be all on the same page so what i'm talking about is when i say that there is a synchronous meeting i'm talking about having a session uh, and a session is usually means that it has a start time and an end time you know in the on the clock uh, you have you have a, a, a session means that a participation happens within that time span, right? So uh, we are separated in space, but we're not separated in time. Those who are able, so, so those who are not able to be here right now, they can't participate, they can't interact. So they might be able to see a recording, but they're not going to be able to ask me a question because they're not here during this time limit. So that, that is a very important characteristic about having a synchronous session. Um, and technologies, uh, um, you can do these sessions with various technologies that allow for you to have these sessions. So I want to make a, 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 a um, we use an, uh, an example to make that distinction because for, uh, many people might say, well, you know, WhatsApp, we text in WhatsApp and we're having a synchronous session. WhatsApp is very different when we're texting because when we're texting through WhatsApp, I don't have a session. You can text me and I can answer you tomorrow. We don't lose interaction. The session doesn't end. So if I have a thread, of a, a text thread in WhatsApp, I call that asynchronous, even if we are maybe responding each other close in time. 
but it's not a requirement that we all be connected at the same time in order to have communication. Now, if I call you through WhatsApp, yes, I need that. That is a session. If you're not in there, if you can't answer, uh, you don't participate in that session. So courses vary a lot in terms of how they deploy uh, synchronous meetings and how many they have. You might have now these days many of the institutions that moved abruptly to online because of the um, um, because of COVID. Um, they simply said all the classes that you were having face to face. Now you're going to have exactly what you had before. You're going to have them uh, through video conferencing. And so these courses are mo some of them are just based on these synchronous meetings. But you might have other courses where you have uh, maybe a platform where you share other things. You even have some kind of asynchronous interaction. But asynchronous meetings are still sort of the important piece. So I call, uh, um, I call courses that have I call them synchronous because the main element, the element that gather are these synchronous meetings, these synchron the, the, these live sessions. Um, so um, I want to also separate from this definition uh, collaboration because a lot of the asynchronous, some, some asynchronous online classes might have collaboration, group collaborations, and these groups on their own they might meet, you know, synchronously, but that is not a central part of the class. So I want to make these distinctions because this will have some influence in how important we consider these live sessions as part of, of the design. Okay, so taking that out of the way, um, let's look at uh, what the literature has to say about the use of these uh, synchronous meetings. So mostly the findings, and these findings are all prior to 2020. Uh, mostly the when when they discuss the value added of having these these uh, live interactions, they're mostly focused on what we call the COI, the community of inquiry model. And for those who don't know the community of inquiry, it's a, it's a very important uh, a sort of uh, conceptual framework used in online learning, still very valid, but certainly developed having in mind a asynchronous interaction. But it doesn't, it doesn't become invalid because of, of live sessions. Um, and as part of this framework, uh, we talk about social cognitive and teaching presences. And actually these three uh, presences interact and have an interplay, one reinforcing the other. For those who don't know uh, uh, this conceptual framework, I, I, I really uh, recommend because it's very rich in terms of helping understand our interactions with students and even students among themselves in the in the online environment. So the literature says that synchronous meetings, they enhance the sense of belonging. And you know, it's true. We can see each other. We have cues. You all can hear my voice. Uh, you can't see my size, which is a very, it's an interesting peculiarity about me. I'm very, very tiny. Um, but there is a sense of community. We're all here. We're listening to the same thing. We might have a chat going on in the background. So it has an important uh, uh, effect on an element that has always been critical in distance education, which is the isolation, right? We want, we are, we do everything we do in terms of design, in terms of delivery to reduce the sense of isolation. So the synchronous meetings, they help with that. And they help in a very immediate way, right? Because we are here, you're listening to me, I can address a question, we can do, there's a lot of immediacy uh, in, in what you can do when you're connected synchronously. So um, it then this, this kind of uh, interaction helps both teaching and the social presence, right? Uh, they help 
learning in the end because when you feel connected when you have a sense of belonging when you and you feel trust you are primed to learn better uh, that's why these other the, these elements are so important something else that is said in the literature uh, that there um, it is very important uh, to have good planning and good planning in order to achieve active learning in these synchronous sessions, which is not exactly what we're doing here. What we're doing here, this is not like a class, uh, you know, that, that is part of a course. Uh, but usually if you're having a course, if I'm teaching biology 101 or I'm teaching anything else, I want to make sure that my students are engaged in an active way because learning really happens when students are active. So when you have these synchronous sessions, you have to plan what you're going to do to have students uh, become active. And this is interesting uh, because a lot of the face-to-face -face experience that people have in traditional setting, they're not active. A lot of them, the teachers come in, they know the subject matter, they lecture for, for two or three hours, and students are not active. They might be taking notes, but students are not active. So, but if we want to achieve learning, we need to consider active learning. And for that, um, these live sessions need to be planned. So that because of this planning, um, you, uh, these sessions become interesting for certain things. For example, if you have a service for online tutoring that students can come and, and they have a question and they can have that question immediately answered, super good use of uh, a live session. Uh, have some activities that students can go into breakout rooms and, and do some kind of negotiation. Use classes to solve more sort of housekeeping issues related to the class where students can ask about assignments and you do a lot of uh, uh, you know explanation of what's going to happen next. Um, these things that you have and that you need an immediate response, these sessions are, are, are very good. Uh, brainstorming, an excellent activity to be done synchronously. So what are the challenges? What, is, what, what does the literature say that are the challenges for these uh, synchronous meetings? First, it really limits conversations. For those who have done online learning for a long time, you know, we cherish the aspect of being in an asynchronous mode and having all sorts of conversations happening at the same time. We might be talking, having a thread talking about something and another thread talking about something else. At the same time, a group is working. And none of these are in in you know uh, making the other have to be quiet because we have multiple channels of communication so we when we are in a in a session like this now with the chat you know we might have two lanes of conversations but not much more than that scheduling becomes really difficult so with big groups you, you know, you really have, you're losing the independence of time, so scheduling becomes uh, problematic. Um, if you, especially if you want to do uh, activities with active learning, the teacher really has to be, you know, uh, able to do a very good job uh, technologically, you know, maybe with put up a Mentimeter and switch screens and have people vote. And there's a lot of things that you need to do um, uh, at the same time. So it requires a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the teacher has to be very savvy uh, to do these things. So this can be a real challenge. And uh, it demands a lot from your technological capability. Everyone needs to be connected at the same time, right? This is the, the big issue with, with synchronous interaction. And I cannot forget the issue about the camera. This is so new. I heard so many teachers saying, my students don't want to put the camera on. Yeah, you know, suddenly you're now on the spot. You know, one thing is to be in a classroom where we're all mingling around. Another is to have your play a face, you know, plastered on everybody's screen. It is intimidating. 
So I think we need to be very, um, very aware of that, that it's not uh, that easy for, for so many students. So what were the lessons learned in 2020, I think, from, uh, yes, the, I see that uh, Jose mentions the issue of privacy totally, uh, but, you know, I've heard so many teachers saying, I want my students to have their cameras on, like, we you know, we have to be policing if students are paying attention or not, as if we could do that in face to face. I'm not sure, but anyway. Um, so what were the lessons learned in 2020 related to this massive use of uh, live sessions? First, and I would say this really from the point of view of uh, working uh, with the bank that we serve Latin America and the Caribbean, that connectivity really matters we suddenly pulled all these students that they didn't have, not only they didn't have the, the, um, the equipment, they didn't have the bandwidth at home. They were sharing their home now with maybe, I don't know how many people who needed to be connected to everybody else at the same time. I mean, this was a huge, huge strain for many, many of our students and our faculty. So connectivity matters. The digital uh, divide is very, very real, and we need to have that in mind. So support systems really matter for this to, to also to work. We need not to just send our faculty to do this, do that, without training, without understanding how things work and, and giving them what they need. You know, they can't become help desks for their students. And there's another uh, element that I think we need to consider very carefully, and that is self-directedness. So one thing is to have a, a, a class with maybe doctoral students that they're all going to be connected and do things and be in breakout rooms and all this. And another is if you're having people, you know, that have no experience with online, they're very young, they don't know what to do, their relationship with all of this is very different. So we need to consider all this when we uh, start making decisions about how to uh, do these live sessions and how to design them integrated into our courses. So let me just uh, put two things here that I want to sort of see what they are and then get them out of the way. Because if we, if we, I want to get them the way so we can talk about other things. So uh, the, the elements of connectivity, you know, synchronous, represents a huge demand on connectivity, like I said. Um, it, uh, for many, uh, you do require uh, models where people can do things offline, you know, uh, really consider, even when you're doing meetings, really consider how to deal with people that cannot be connected online. And in many of the, of the situations throughout this year that I saw, in, in Latin America, you know, we saw people really considering the methodologies that we used in, you know, second generation distance education. You go by a place, you pick up papers, uh, you do things, and then you hand them back. And it worked. It worked. Use of uh, uh, radio, use of television. I think when we want to solve a problem, we need to look at our audience, understand their needs, understand their limitations, and really think of solutions that address that and not try to use the technology, the shiniest one. So that's very something very important to have in mind. Um, and the other part is that many students didn't even have the appropriate environment at home. They might even be connected, but you know, this camera, I go back to the camera thing, you're in a room that you're sharing with other people, that things are happening in the background, that is noisy, and you're asking these students to be there for three hours, you know. It's really, it's really demanding. So depending on age, uh, depending on situations and families, uh, this can be really a, a huge challenge. I mean, we, we had in our webinars at the bank conversations with school teachers, you know, that were teaching small kids, uh, like super, super demanding. Okay, so let's 
I want to take that out of the way to continue the conversation thinking that, okay, I don't have a problem with connectivity. I have an audience that can really absorb the live sessions. And I want to do that so we can, you know, go into uh, a, a discussion that actually talks about how best to do it and not, you know, be, be, be uh, hung up on the issues of the, of the digital divide that I mentioned before. So I wanted to then, because of that, considering that connectivity is solved, the equipment is solved, how does self-directedness affect uh, how students experience online learning? And this actually, uh, this, this thinking of self-directedness really came to my mind when, uh, when I was facilitating uh, some Quality Matters uh, courses that talked about self-directedness and how we need to consider the level of self-directedness uh, um, of our students to decide how we are going to design the course and how do we address students, how do we provide uh, uh, you know, feedback, all of this. And I then, uh, it made me think that synchronous can really be a tool uh, that can address different levels of self-directedness and can actually help uh, bring our students to more advanced levels of self-directedness. So what I want to consider uh, in this context is that many students that are in the first stages of self-directedness, you know, they might not have any experience with, with online. They're very used to face-to-face. -to -face. So the synchronous might be a way to bring them, you know, to bring them along in order to become more independent. Uh, and the, the other element related to this is that many students that were having their classes in a more traditional environment, these environments were, were such that self-directedness was not really part of it. It was really a model where students are very, very dependent. And so when they move to the virtual environment, you can use these synchronous meetings again to uh, uh, help students advance in their capacity to become dependent learners. And I mentioned that I um, uh, really started thinking about this because of this, uh, the what this this uh, staged self-directed learning model from Grow that talks about stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. If you Google this model, it's everywhere. You can find them, and it's very interesting. And I think it's a very interesting way to look assess our students related to the aspect of self-directedness, and then understand what kind of teacher is needed on the other side. So if we consider synchronous as a way to mitigate lack of self-directedness, uh, we can, you know, keep synchronous, you know, maybe in the beginning mimicking a little bit more a face-to-face -face meeting, you know, so it's less threatening um, and you keep more rigid schedules. Um, so people, you know, feel now I'm, I'm moving away from what I'm used to, but this is very not too far out from what I'm used to. Um, and then you could consider that you start transitioning from uh, a more um, having more of these synchronous meetings to maybe an environment where you start having less of them because the synchronous meetings are used to sort of provide more constant feedback and more uh, uh, um, sort of control. And as students become more independent, you can start introducing uh, activities that can be done asynchronous, that people can manage their time and maybe finding a balance where the two kinds of activities have uh, some kind of interplay and then you have a class that can become that can have elements that are positive from both kinds of uh, interaction and so what would be uh, some instructional design strategies uh, for these meetings uh, 
first consider them as a transition from face to face to online. Um, so you have you start out with more frequent synchronous meetings, and then you, you, you start helping students become more independent, that they can manage their time better, and that they understand that the value of the asynchronous interaction that is usually, you know, it, the, the value of the time that you have to think about something and then write it to, to people. No, that's, that's the value of asynchronous, where you can develop much better critical thinking. You can develop analytical skills. You have multiple threads of conversation. But in order to get there, you might use asynchronous exactly as a bridge for that kind of interaction. And so I would say that if you are designing, so this the, the what you see on your screen on the left side is if you're coming with your course from face to face to synchronous this is kind of what i suggest you you do this sort of uh, a movement now if you are designing your course from scratch you might want to consider uh, an interesting rule of thumb that i also learned in in a q in a quality matter webinar that you maybe think of your class totally asynchronous. Think that you're not going to have any synchronous activity. And after you have all of that laid out, then you say, OK, where is it in this class that I add meetings and small synchronous activities that I really bring the value of these live sessions? the immediacy, the, the sense of belonging, having milestones that are, that are you know, very well marked in the, in the process of the course. So for example, we have to work on a very complex problem. OK, let's do a live session for that. We want to build social connections. Let's use a live session for that. Let's have students do presentations. Let's have debates. So then I actually use these, these live events very, very well planned, you know, and integrated in the full uh, course. Um, another, and so I want to wrap the, the whole uh, conversation about design uh, to remind people that we need to think about active learning and that the live sessions don't need to be uh, just lecturing. And so how can we bring active learning into these live sessions? First, again, have students prepare for, for these meetings, you know, sort of a seminar kind of environment. Um, use shared screens with problems and whiteboards that students can write on, do polling. Some of, of you already have put some of these tools that can be used for, for polling, for questions. Uh, prompt, I uh, have questions that have people maybe stop a little bit, think about them, write them down. Have breakout rooms. Do a minute paper at the end of a session. Uh, student presentations I mentioned before. Promote the chat area to have this sort of parallel conversations. Give responsibility to students. Maybe students have roles that they do something during the live sessions. All of this contributes to, to active learning. Um, and then other things uh, are related to improving engagement during synchronous meetings. Um, you already mentioned some of these technologies that help presentation of content, content that is more lively. Um, consider that uh, learning happens through interaction with content. It happens through interaction with instructor. It happens with uh, interaction with colleagues. Maybe have uh, little breaks, offline breaks, where people can do things, reflections, and so forth, and then come back. Um, and uh, so now I invite you to think about what are the strategies that you use to engage a students in synchronous meetings. Uh, there are many. And I think actually sharing these strategies can be, can be very, very useful. So I yeah. open up. I think I went a little bit over. Uh, yes. Yeah. Actually, I don't know if you are able to read the chat. Yes, um, I am. 
Ah, okay, great. But Orit from College of Staten Island, I guess he's, he's sharing about uh, that he made a private work in Niger at home for their students. Huh? So, a. Yes. Private working niche at home, simple, functional, small budget, so their video only shares their workspace. Yes, I mean, people are becoming very, very creative. Um, and I think I think this kind of example is, some, you know, you need to be listening to students, right, to, um, to and be very open to, to producing solutions that might be a little bit out of the box. Excellent. I don't know, Jalixa, if they can uh, share the audio, activate the audio, so Ori can share this initiative mm -hmm. because that's yes. very well uh, interesting. Yes, they can. So they can either write on the chat or open their microphones and talk. Ori, that you are able to yeah. activate the <laughs> Okay. Ah, you're a lady. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. No worries. Are you able to hear me now? <laughs> it's a unitex name, I guess. <laughs> Go ahead. Are you, are you able to hear me well? Yeah, I hear you very well. Go ahead. We hear you, yes. Just um, a few quick notes. First of all, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. An opportunity to get together to see all your recommendations and for us to share. I work as a chief technician in computer science. They also teach a lab course. They teach it synchronously. So just in a nutshell, I use Menti and Padlet as engagement tools. The other initiative I've done is to help students create, as I have had to do, a seven-footer as it's known in interior design, which is that space of seven feet by seven feet. That's their workspace. Um, I've helped them with simple budget ideas, how to put a poster there uh -huh. behind them. Um, and these are all ideas that I've done as well. I want to mention quickly that another major change I've made, and this is through attending workshops and seminars within CUNY in the United States and even international, which I can do now for my dining room. Um, I've added to my PowerPoint slides art and music before the class actually starts. The music contributed soundtracks from the students. I collect them from the students, and then I give credit to the student who has contributed that soundtrack. These are things that I did not need in the physical classroom, but these are little like sprinkles to spice up the presentation. So this has worked way, and the art also, I got that idea from the National Gallery of Art. They have programs each week on how to include art, no matter which topic you're teaching, to include art because that increases critical thinking, and it, it serves some type of engagement that's beyond what I can do when it's purely virtual. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you at the uh, beginning. It was difficult to hear, but uh, Stella, if you want yes. to. Yes, she, share uh, for a little those bit. who were, yes, the, for those who, who uh, were not listening very well, she, so I, I, I don't have the experience, so I'm just going to, uh, up top of my head of what I listened to. So she helped a lot of the students even to put together their environment so they could, uh, you know, be in a, in a physical space that was uh, um, good for these kind of synchronous uh, meetings. And she also talked about things that she did in the class. She used music. She invited students to have their own tracks of music so they felt that they were participating uh, in, in this environment. I, I think this is really interesting. I think it's recognizing the fact that you help them even with their physical environment. It's really recognizing the, some of the difficulties uh, that students had. I, I think it relates to a point that I didn't make in this uh, presentation, but I'm sure that all of you have um, experienced throughout this year. Empathy has really become the word uh, that we need to take with us, right? Um, I think we need to start thinking of our uh, relationship with students uh, 
with any mode, having empathy as the leading element of uh, decision making uh, in in not only d during this time, but as something that we take with us after this this experience that we all had. Yubelkis, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Carlos. Okay. We cannot right. see you, but we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, no worries. The, the, the camera is misbehaving. But as we get the, the other question, uh, Stella, <clears throat> can you share with us, uh, again, first of all, you know, excellent presentation. Thank you for, for sharing your experience and, again, everything that you are doing uh, for the community uh, um, in higher ed and, of course, through the region. But can you talk about th that that item, maybe that topic that has been maybe the one that um, requires more conversation with colleagues than than the usual, you know, uh, uh, type of, of, of topic. So, you know, sometimes you have a topic that you just, you know, start uh, the conversation and it comes across really, really quickly mm -hmm. and, and people grasp it. Can you talk about those uh, that in, in your experience uh, through all this time, uh, you know, require maybe more a nudging and more, you know, a, a conversation, if you will. So I think uh, some of them relate to this. Uh, they, they actually end up, we, we end up talking about this synchronous, asynchronous, mostly because people uh, have to understand uh, mm -hmm. concepts such as uh, the stretching of time, for example, you know, the understanding that in the virtual environment, you need to think of everything now in a stretched, the time stretches out, right, in order to have uh, uh, um, the cognitive uh, processes to happen. But I think it, it, this relates to um, the myth, right, the myth that the fate that we enter a physical classroom and because I know the content, I present the content and the learning happens. I think all of this is very connected, but it comes back to that. So people that had uh, uh, models of, of teaching and learning that were not uh, based on a paradigm that students are the center and that active learning is what makes learning happen, they probably are the ones who had the most difficulty to switch to an environment where uh, everything has to be done virtually. And that concept is has to uh, comes up over and over again and and very much connected to assessment. Mm -hmm. Because because people come from this very traditional model where uh, I I am thrown, people throw content at me, and mm -hmm. then I do an exam and I'm measured in a very non, not based on performance at all, um, and this is learning. And I think that this, this thing has really been part of the conversation, not only for higher education, but for example, my work at the bank is really with a lot of online courses that are for uh, professional capacity building. And a lot of times when you're talking about training, people think that you come in, you sit down, you receive content and training is done. So when you mm -hmm. start asking the question, what do you want people to be able to do at the end of this, that breaks up. Uh, you know, how are you going to measure that people have learned? And so that really changes very much the conversation. It's a, it's a conversation that takes lots of many, um, many layers, you know, of, uh -huh. of elements to, of elements. to discuss. Okay. All right. I have another question, but Yubelkis, before I ask that one, any other questions from the audience? Uh, questions? No. We have a lot of comments uh, thanking uh, Dr. Porto for his wonderful presentations and everybody's agree with uh, some of the strategies that have been shared by her and also by some of the participants. So go ahead with your question. Let you know if we have another question. Please, if you have questions. Uh, if I can just say a question quickly. Well, my, my, ah, my observation is okay. Paul, Paul, Paul Blackman here. Okay, go ahead. 
Um, thank you, uh, Stella. Excellent presentation, almost like being in class again. Um, <laughs> my observation is that people like ourselves, for, for, for people like ourselves who grew up in asynchronous days, it's very easy to appreciate the role that asynchronous learning plays in the process. My my problem is is getting people to understand that mm -hmm. because you're synchronous, because your life is not just like being in your class, and therefore mm -hmm. it's a real challenge to explain to them the 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 benefit or the importance or the role that asynchronous learning can play must play uh, in the process. So that really has been my 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 challenge from my end. Totally. And then very quickly, I want to commend you for your observations about what's happening in the developing countries, all the issues, because I'm glad that the IDB has someone like you who has an appreciation of the real challenges that the students and families and so on would have, uh, would have, would have encountered in, in this move to, to, to online. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, uh, Thank you. It's lovely to hear your voice, Paul. And I think your point about um, un the understanding of the asynchronous uh, uh, interaction, that is where I think that we can use synchronous in the, the, the whole uh, conversation about synchronous mitigating and maybe uh, helping the synchronous helping the understanding of what the asynchronous is. So instead of just saying, you know, you have to do this asynchronous, you have the async, you need to actually use what people know, what people are used to doing to then do that in a way that it's almost like you're really holding their hands in the beginning and slowly they will start understanding that yes, we can do things asynchronous and there is a value, you know, and, and especially using analogies with, you know, we interact on Facebook. We have conversations that last for days. We have our WhatsApp friends that we have long conversations. So I think we need to uh, uh, sort of put ourselves in, 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 in their roles and understand that what they need is this support to become feel less vulnerable, right? I think the the feeling of being is something that sometimes stalls us to do new things. So, so yeah, I would I would I would say that. And, and Stella, my question was um, along those lines. Um, certainly, the 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 pandemic uh, and I mean, first of all, the pandemic has brought up to the surface the need for for support and for training and for well-developed professional development activities for for faculty right um, um that has been you know a perennial a perennial challenge for for us but the the work you do from the bank uh, addresses professional development uh, in in various ways uh, uh, to those countries can you talk about a, a, not only how that service has been received, but but what is the 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 most frequent uh, request, if you will, or need that has you, you have been able to identify through through all this time uh, uh, through, through the work you do from the bank in in the region we serve you serve. I'm sorry. Right. So 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 the initiative that we launched uh, a year ago in March. So before the pandemic, we didn't do, uh, we had a couple of courses about online learning, you know, that we offered, but mostly what the bank was offering was online for, uh, you know, what, what development topics. So, you know, online courses about uh, climate change and online courses about other things. Mm -hmm. And what happened when the, when the pandemic hit is we is started the initiative uh, called Moving Online, right? And I, I might have the link here, I'm not sure. Uh, so, uh, no, but you can go to cursosiadb.org and you can look for Moving Online. The, the, it, the only thing is that everything is in Spanish. So, Moving Online came about to create two things. One was to share the resources because I think that helps a lot with uh, uh, design. It's to have certain things that are ready to go, right? So, so you know, uh, uh, templates of things and and student guides and things we share. We we use Creative Commons, so we share a lot of that. And we created this community. And but after that, we realized that what people want needed was guidance. And I think they needed guidance. First of all, I think the 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 
most important point was really to understand course design. I think those that were teaching face-to-face, -face, course design was not part of their conversation. Maybe some people, but in most places, you know, and I was a professor before getting into this world, I was teaching computer science and, you know, I just came to teach computer science because I had a doctor in computer science, but not because I, need, I knew how to teach. And so mm -hmm. I think design and structural design, the understanding that it's not, the content is not the king, but that I have to create activities that promote the interaction of students with content that promote the interaction of students among themselves that was a critical piece that had to introduce that design mm -hmm. good design is critical and that good design requires time that you can't just next day produce something and that good design many times requires uh, support from institutions uh, and, and, you know, for example, to have consistency through courses, uh, for example, building authentic assessment. Authentic assessment was a major uh, uh, piece of conversation because people were so worried with grading. It's all about grading. People didn't know how to separate grading and assessment. One thing is assessment. Grading is something else, you know, so that these right. were constant elements, even though people were asking about technology. I think our point was to say it's not the technology. It's it's something else, you know. You I don't know if there is another question before I ask uh, one, one more. And no, we just see a lot of comments that excellent presentation as usual. They job work by heads. Thank you, eh, Milagros. Also, Carmen Marrero mentioned that she always prefer presentations that incorporate the literature as well as the relevant professional experience like Dr. Porto did. So thanks. She really appreciate that. And also Orit, the one who shared her experience, say a humbling experience for me, which developed even greater empathy for our student was the power Oh, oh my God! Yes, yeah, she had she had a, an issue of power Engineer. outage and had to ah, okay. and had to connect through her phone with no Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, students went through students and teachers went through incredible situations. Yes. That's oh true. yeah, the, the whole book, the whole book. The but, whole but book. Stella, the, Stella, the the. I guess, you know, we, we still have, I mean, of course, with these topics, we can stay until midnight. Uh, it's po it's totally. possible, but the, but the availability <laughs> is challenging, right? But um, the, the, if, if, I, if I can ask, um, if you happen to have a crystal ball, I'm not sure if you yeah. have that, you know, a, a <laughs> stair, you know, in a, in a drawer, okay, somewhere. <laughs> but what, what um, again, you know, in your experience, and again, the, 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 the reach you have, uh, because of the work uh, you do with the, with the bank, um, how do you see how do you see the maybe the the immediate uh, midterm type of future, if you will mid range, I'm sorry, type of mm. future situation in terms mm. of um, what may be happening after all this, you know, and and again talking about the assessment and the grading, the the, mm. the examples that you shared to the presentation and this and this needs from the from the various countries. How how do you see the movie playing in the next two three years? So, first, there are the haves and the have-nots, right, uh, Carlos? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the and and what they have in front of them is very different. I I, I would say. That certainly things have changed, and I think students' expectations also have changed uh, enormously. Um, so, in in the near future, I think that people are going to start thinking, not understanding that the planning is something very important. I, I really do. I really think that that aspect has uh, uh, sunk in. I think uh, at, mm -hmm. at a certain level. I, I also think that moving forward, there will be more hybrid uh, possibilities, meaning people will uh, understand that there, even though we can be in the, let's say that we can be all in the same room, 
there is, even we suffered through all of this, you know, people are talking, oh, Zoom fatigue and all this stuff. But I think that there is an understanding, you know, and we had an example here of people saying, you know, I couldn't do this in my face-to-face -face class. Uh, I couldn't, mm -hmm. for example, bring a guest who knows about something or other that she couldn't ever talk to my class and now I can easily bring that person. So I think there will be a lot of uh, low hanging fruits of things that, that, that expand at our possibilities. Now, in a longer term, now talking more from a leadership point of view, I think that leaders should be, and I'm not sure, I don't have the crystal ball, but the, what they should be looking at is that, you know, digital transformation is here. So what I see is that we knew, we knew that automation was happening. We knew that some of the things that are happening in society that are happening now were coming. What, what happened in 2020, I think, is sort of an acceleration of a lot of things and sort of tsunami that hit, you know, with very little preparation because a lot of these things, you know, these, you know. these leaders, they knew it was there, you know, but they said, oh, you know, I can put this to the side and now I think that they cannot and what I'm saying here is change in how uh, institutions are organized especially in how we support faculty in how we train faculty in how we prepare students to learn and also to see that these students have to become lifelong learners, you know. And I think lifelong learning has been a, a, a word that people throw here and there, but it applies to everyone, you know. And, and I think this digital transformation has to start happening at all levels. You know, it's really looking at the system of of education we we talked about the system of online education it's just, now i think there is a blur there and we need to think in a systemic way and all levels of institutions need to be addressed uh, based on the experience we had so i think there's a lot of work to be done at that level really okay all right thank not you not sure thank if you i for, answered for... what you wanted <laughs> No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for letting us see the crystal ball that you are looking at. That's, that's, uh, that's good. That's good. It's opaque. That's, that's it's opaque. No, no, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, we, like I said, I just want to see what well, my, my question, right, for the benefit of the audience mm -hmm. is, yes. is how you are seeing, seeing things from your, from your uh, seat, right, from where you are. Uh, yeah, uh, digital, digital transformation. But exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. All right. At the at the government well, level too, yeah. Sure. No, no, that yeah. that's very true. Um, I I don't think I have any other questions. Uh, maybe maybe one more if it is there uh, from the group Jubelkis. If not, we can we can uh, adjourn. No, I think we can uh, uh, finish the webinar. But I'm putting some announcement on the chat. Just uh, people are not reading the chat. Just to remember that tomorrow we have a webinar at 10 a.m. for students. It's, it will be in Spanish, and the title is Emprendimiento Emocional, La Ciencia de la Psicología en Emprendimiento. And this uh, topic, it could be for anyone, so you are invited to join us too, and please help us to promote this among your students, and all the information is in the chat or in our website. Also, remember that we will be, the recording will be published on the same page that you uh, register at the at the bottom of the page you will see all the different recordings of all the webinars we have held uh before and remember that you will be receiving an email uh, for completing a survey to help us evaluate this uh webinar and also help us identify other different services uh um improve our services to continue supporting you and also your students. And finally, uh, remember that if you are interested in a certificate of participation, remember to send an email at infoaheads.org with your full name and the title of this webinar in order to prepare uh, and send it to you. Allow us at least two weeks to receive your certificate. And if you don't receive it after two weeks, please follow up 
follow us, uh, Mela, send us an email to follow up. We don't, we, we truly appreciate your patience. Thank you, Stella. Has been a pleasure yes, I, knowing you. Uh, just, um, uh, I wanted to just say that I put on the chat uh, two links. One oh, is yes. uh, the initiative of moving online. If you speak Spanish, this is open to everyone. Anybody can register. It's a community that discusses all sorts of things. And I also put the link of our webinars. Now we call them Las Charlas. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, the everything that we did in 2020 is recorded there. You have one with Carlos Morales there too, because he was our, our invited guest. <laughs> and so I invite you all to join. It's it's an open group, and it's definitely uh, moving forward. And the theme that we have now in the beginning of the year is active learning and the second theme of the year that that lasts for three months is going to be evaluation and assessment so I, I invite you to to participate thank you gracias. thank you so much gracias, gracias. Sí, gracias. gracias a todos Gracias, de verdad. Thank you so much. We uh, right. remember that the recording will be available, if not this afternoon, by tomorrow. And also the presentation, you can download it in a PDF format. Thank you, Stella, for sharing and, uh, that with us. And we hope that we can mm. see you probably face-to-face uh, -face when this COVID uh, finally end, or you know, we control this <laughs> pandemic. Uh, or if not, then virtually. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day and great week. Bye, everyone. We're, Bye -bye. we're almost Friday. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.